Harpreet Singh, welcoming you to the Future of Work Pioneers podcast. Today, we are speaking with Diane Gerson, the CHRO of IBM. Diane is responsible for the people and culture of IBM's 360,000 person workforce, covering 172 countries. In 2018, Diane was named HR Executive of the Year by HR Executive Magazine and was elected Fellow of the National Academy of Human Resources, the highest honor granted in the human resource profession. In 2019, she was named by Business Insider to the top 100 people changing the world of business. Thank you. Thank you, Humphrey. It's my pleasure. So um, I want to begin by asking you about your background, any defining moments that attracted you to the field of HR. I, I know that uh, you know, uh, your, your uh, academic background also intersects with some of the issues you're tackling. You spent some time at MIT Sloan uh, as a PhD candidate. So m- maybe give, give us uh, some insight. How, how did you get started? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, yes, I did uh, spend some wonderful time in your in your home grounds in Boston um, at MIT, and that was actually a formative moment for me because it was pre ARPANET, uh, pre internet. We were on the DARPANET, and um, we had uh, we had the first email system uh, that was called um, Emacs, and I got to see how work was changing and um, the impact of. Um, of, of technology on work. And I, I, to be honest, I fell in love with that at the time, um, that there sure weren't any jobs in that field. So, um, so I actually went into, uh, went into consulting and got to do some very interesting work. It eventually ended up uh, doing compensation consulting, which is, um, at, well, at least at the time, was doing organization consulting and drag because you were essentially talking about change and, um, and how to change behavior. So I did that for a while and then I came to IBM to lead compensation and benefits and um, then you know fell into HR that way fairly late in my career. So I've been head of HR at IBM now for seven years and uh, it's, been, it's been a real joy. It's such, such an exciting field right now. No, that's great. So, so in, in your uh, discussions, you often talk about moving from HR 2.0 to HR 3.0. Can you tell us what do you mean, about, mean by 2.0 and 3.0 and what this shift means yeah. for future work? Yeah, well, look, I mean, 2.0 was all about re-engineering, and um, that was a very long phase, right? It, it, it was, um, you know, quite, quite well known, I think, in the 80s and 90s. Um, well, it's it's still took hold. Even even um, maybe five years ago, companies were doing reengineering. But it was all about um, taking advantage of the internet and the low cost of computing and moving work to places where it could be done more efficiently. Right. So you had call centers. You had um, you had the offshore um, facilities. You had shared service. All of that was kind of the back end that was being reinvented and. What 3.0 is about is actually um, almost like the hangover of that was really bad experience for people at the other end, right? If you were an employee and you were dealing with this, it was a nightmare. I mean, you had, you know, um, a million clicks to get anything done. It would be a million different um, sites to go and visit to solve a problem because everything was organized around the process. The process was what was king, right? So the owner of the process had a very efficient process, but the experience of solving a problem, like how to leave the company um, or how to join it or something like that, um, would be a would be a nightmare because you know you have to get your badge, you have to get your computer, you have to get you know your Wi-Fi set up, you um, you know your phone needs to work. I mean, all sorts of different things have to happen. Your healthcare and so forth, and that's a lot of different sites. If you use a re-engineering model, which is what 2.0 is all about, 3.0 is about the experience. So the great thing about digital technology is that it enables you to work off of integrated data platforms so that you can create fantastic experiences for the user, right? You can actually put the user at the center of your design instead of trying to be efficient with your process and, um, and design something that is really irresistible to them, right? So that's what, in a nutshell, what's, that's what 3.0 does. It, it focuses on the experience of the receiver, whether it's the manager or the employee, 
Um, the other thing that it does is it takes advantage of AI to get better management decisions. So instead of them having to, you know, use intuition or to, in 2.0, they got a lot of reports, right? Oh, you've got really high turnover rates. Well, that's interesting, but what do I do about it, right? Um, and, uh, you know, 3.0 would say, you know, if you carry on that rate you're going, we predict you'll only have three data scientists left by the end of next month, you know, and, um, and this, these are the characteristics of the people who are leaving. And so we would anticipate that these eight people have a high propensity to leave, and these are the things that would cause them to stay. So that's what AI can help you do in 3.0 go from reporting to actually predicting and prescribing as a, um, as a way of supporting your managers. And then of course you get better productivity with automation, which is the third part of 3.0. And, um, and so much of it is just work that is low value, at least in my function, you know, a lot of um, validating uh, data, um, reconciling data in payroll, for example, or in benefits. Um, and, uh, and it's, 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 um, it's work that tended to have high turnover because it was fairly boring. Uh, and so now what we found are the people who are still in that organization are doing higher value work. They're doing data analytics instead of reconciling data. So, um, so those are the three things we get out of 3.0, you know, better productivity, better employee experience, and better manager decisions. So, so two, two things you mentioned are very interesting. One is the, the predictive and prescriptive analytics. Uh, so how are you deploying that? And then the second question is around customer experience. You're not going to get that from the dinosaurs we have, uh, the, the legacy data systems, right? So, so how, how do you reimagine these uh, new systems uh, in your current context? So we actually did start with retention, of, you know, because we, we wanted to make sure that we retained our best talent. Um, and, um, and so that is using AI, it's using deep learning, and it, it finds niche cases, right? So um, it's not like an algorithm that applies everywhere, but the great thing about deep learning is it can find those niche cases and say, you know, this is, these people will, will be leaving because there's this corner case that we found. Um, so for us, you know, our ROI on this is, is uh, off the charts. I mean, I have no problem getting money from finance to fund any of the, um, of the proactive retention work that I do. And I've been doing it since uh, 2009. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a, it's a moneymaker, you know, for the company, really, uh, if you look at it from that perspective. But, um, but, the, you know, but, but AI also enables you to look at who has a high propensity to upskill. Um, so why would you invest in somebody who doesn't have the innate characteristics of somebody who will be successful when they're upskilled? Um, so that would be another really helpful case. Um, you know, it used to be that we would just rely on what managers said about who the high performers or high potential people were. And, and that was, you know, good to a point, right? And you might spend a lot of time just, you know, doing calibration and stuff like that, which kind of took a lot of time. But actually, um, you can predict who are the higher performers and higher uh, potential people, um, or I shouldn't say predict, it's infer. You would infer who those people are based on a lot of data that you already have. And, um, you know, you have data about who got the higher bonuses. Um, so even though they might not have been, you know, the highest, quote, performers in the system, um, they are the ones who regularly seem to get the most recognition, the most pay, um, whenever there's a little money to go around, they always get some of it, you know? Um, so it's, it's those kinds of things that it'll pick up and um, it'll pick up, you know, look, if someone hasn't gotten any peer recognition, maybe they've got a collaboration issue. So it'll nudge the manager to say, Hey, have you noticed this? Um, so it's, it's, it's helpful from that perspective. It detects patterns. Um, it infers skills, which for us is huge, because skills is the most important thing that we have really in an organization that's constantly changing. You need to have skills at the at the um, at the uh, leading edge, and the shelf life of skills in our industry is so small. So for us, we can infer what skills people have based on what they're doing and um, what they're talking about, um, where they show up, what's in their pipeline, all sorts of, you know, their digital footprint, in other words, which is massive. And, um, you know, it used to be you'd rely on a one-page resume to know what someone's skills were because, you know, we were, we were 
constrained by our eyes, you know, our two eyes. You can only read so much, right? Um, when, when you think about it, not a great way to find out somebody's skills when you actually have the entire magnitude of their digital footprint at your disposal. And if you can use AI um, to draw and infer from that what someone's skills are and at what level, um, you're going to be a lot more accurate. Yeah, no, that, that's very interesting. So, so the skills, um, the, the, the bonus is, uh, you know, giving us some indication about performance. But then how do you... Uh, look at the f the skills in the, this context. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, you, you obviously have a lot of data at your disposal. You've got three hundred sixty thousand people, so you're collecting a lot of data. But how do you collect skills based data? Yeah, it's it's in everything. So, for example, if you're working on projects and there are project assessments of your work, it'll it'll have a look at that. If you're writing client reports, if you're um, you know you have if you're in sales and you have a pipeline, and the pipeline includes you know, certain types of AI. Well, okay, in order for you to have that pipeline, you actually had to talk to a client about that. Um, it will obviously be in your resume. It will be in what you're blogging about. Um, it, it's, um, it's, it's, I mean, your digital footprint is, is pretty huge when you think about it. Um, now, what we don't do is we don't look in your email. We don't snoop. Um, so we don't look in your email. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't look in your Slack channels. Um, so certain things are off limits for sure, because we don't want people to feel like someone's looking over their shoulder, but their work products are what we're looking at. And, um, and it's, uh, it's pretty huge. Yeah. And, and, and the, um, uh, my, my other question was around uh, the user experience. So, um, uh, how are you reimagining systems uh, so that they uh, look and feel more modern and uh, are more usable? Yeah, well, look, I mean, in the old days, you would get notes, um, you know, uh, saying, dear employee, as an example, right, um, which, which was jarring for people who were used to getting, you know, notes from, well, whatever, you know, Amazon or um, uh, anywhere they shopped that said, you know, uh, dear Diane. And, um, it, you know, they're like, hey, I work here and they don't know my name, but, you know, some nobody in, in, in uh, some, some e-commerce e e e uh, organization knows my name. And um, that's pretty simple. But the fact is personalization has become really important for people to even pay attention to what you have to say. So we adopted our own, uh, we, we had our own um, e-commerce capability and we took it over. It's called Silver Pop. So we brought it into HR and we said, okay, we're going to personalize everything. And not only are we going to personalize the who does it, you know, what, what do we call them, but what they get, right? So we segmented the population. And, uh, and so that was, that was just, I mean, it's fairly basic, but it's, it's what's expected, right? Um, the second thing that's really important is, Communication used to be just one way, uh, you know, you'd get sort of um, an email or maybe there would be a video from your CEO, but, um, but we're all used to feedback, right? Um, in fact, what really struck me once was somebody said to me, you know, I posted this, um, I posted this thing on Facebook with, uh, it was around Christmas time. Um, of a loaf of bread that I baked and um, I only got 55 likes. And, and I said, you know what, if I got 55 responses the next year from somebody who, you know, from the people I sent Christmas cards to, I'd be really happy. You know? So it just reinforces that people expect instantaneous feedback. And, um, and it, you know, we're, we've, we completely flipped into a world where if you're not able to give feedback right away and receive it right away, it, it's just, um, it's not, not meeting your expectations. So, so creating an environment where you can create spaces for people to give you feedback, to communicate, to say what they like, what they don't like, um, all of this is critical to having an employee experience that um, meets that consumer grade expectation that's been set. You, you, you talked about uh, also leveraging chatbots uh, in, in some of your other discussions. Right. So, right. Uh, how, how are you doing that? Is, is that all... Um, uh, I guess AI driven, or is there a human component uh, as well? Yeah, no, we're, we're lucky to have Watson, right? So Watson, not only you know, I, and a lot of chatbots, you have to feed in the question and the answer, which gets a bit tiresome after a while, I'm sure, for companies that you know, like us, are constantly changing. Um, so what um, what our AI chatbots do is they actually learn, and so um, they know, for example, if if I typed in if I typed in today into our um, travel uh, chatbot to say 
you know, uh, can I travel to the UK? It'll come back and say, there's a 14 day quarantine. Um, so, you know, that's recent information, but it's pulled from our travel advisories and it knows to respond that way. Um, so it's, you know, it's helpful because, um, you know, you're dealing in a world where the information is constant, constantly changing. And, um, and what it also does, our, our chatbots now do is they'll actually do a transaction for you. Um, so it'll turn around and say, do you need us to book you a flight as opposed to just answering your question, right? Um, the one that is the most hated, has always been the most hated is how do I transfer an employee to another unit? And, um, and it used to be 39 clicks to get it done, if you can imagine, in the old world. And today it comes back and it says, would you like me to do it for you? And um, so, you know, people are just thrilled with that. It's just a completely different world. So is that um, RPA happening in the background? Somewhere? That's right. That's right. It's RPA happening in the background. Nice. That's very nice. This episode is brought to you by Experfy. Incubated in Harvard Innovation Lab, Experfy provides custom future of work solutions, such as private talent clouds and skill taxonomies. Expertify differentiates itself by using subject matter experts to pre-vet and pipeline candidates for AI and high-end technology skills. However, Expertify Talent Cloud Platform is skill agnostic and can be licensed to build custom talent clouds for any and all skills. In a different use case, enterprises interested in employee intermobility can license the Expertify platform to create an internal gigs marketplace where interested employees can be algorithmically matched to projects, gamifying their learning experience. Visit www.expertify.com for more information. So, so this, you know, transforming an HR organization to leverage technology, that, that, that's a, a very complicated task. Uh, how, how did you go about doing it? Well, you know, um, I happen to work for an IT company, so that really helps. And um, I, I guess, you know, IBM is full of people who are really curious and want to learn. I got to work with some great data scientists in our research organization when I first started out on this journey, uh, brought them into my HR organization. I now have 26 research sci uh, data scientists in my organization, but more importantly, have just reinforced for all of my team that data analytics um, is so important and, um, and that it, it's our, all of our jobs to know it. I mean, HR has dramatically changed. The kind of skills that are required have dramatically changed. And, um, and so, you know, I'm really proud to say that we're all getting their digital badges. They're, you know, they're, they're on their way. So, so uh, getting the technology implemented often is easier than the culture of change. So um, have you had to invest resources there or figure out how to do that? Yeah, you know, um, the, the things, we learned some things along the way. So I'll give you an example. The first year we did, um, uh, what we call proactive retention, which was identifying people that we knew were going to leave. We um, identified people who had like a greater than 50% propensity to leave. And we sent notes to the manager saying, give this person a 10% increase. Um, and the managers revolted. They're like, no, wait a minute. I know that, you know, Judy here is more likely to leave than Sarah, but you're telling me I have to give the, the money to Sarah. And uh, what makes you think way back wherever you are, you know, uh, that, that Sarah is the one who's going to go. And, um, and so our response, which was not a good one, was you can't give the money to Judy, but if you don't want to give it to Sarah, that would be just fine. So then the next year we came back and we said, you know what, the attrition rate, the turnover rate of the people who got it versus the ones that didn't um, was 30% less. In other words, two thirds more left who didn't get it than got it. So that was data. The managers need data to change, start changing their beliefs and we didn't have their beliefs. So that was really helpful. Um, but we also realized you have to be way more transparent and, you know, uh, telling them why, what, what was it that caused us to believe that Sarah would leave and not Judy was really important. We needed to open up the tent. And so now we're way more transparent and, um, in fact, we even have an uh, we have a uh, AI system for determining what salary increase to give all of your employees, and it'll say, you know, look, um, Diane here, you know, maybe a high performer, but the 
the um, market value of her work has is is has not gone up. Um, but more importantly, the market demand for people with her skills is uh, is low, and um, and so therefore you know don't give her an increase. And what's that doing? It's going and scouring all the job postings for my for my skills and saying there just aren't any, you know, or there are not many. And, um, and so it's able to bring the external world in. So when they saw that, they were like, okay, now I get it. Even though I think Diane's really good and she's been a high performer, you're telling me there are no job postings for people with her skill and that there's very limited demand internally, which is the other thing we look at for people with her skill. So why would I give her an increase, right? So it, it's it, being way more transparent has really helped. And are, are you looking at, uh, since skills are kind of uh, a recurring theme here, are you looking at um, or mapping the skills and job postings and uh, on people's resumes as well somewhere? So we have a way of inferring people's skills from their resumes. Mm -hmm. um, so that if you went on our website today and you, you didn't, you just, you don't have to hunt for a job anymore. All you need to do is if you want Watson to help you is upload your resume and then Watson will look at your resume infer your skills and automatically map it to jobs that we have open. And it'll show you maybe you're 70% matched to this and 90% matched to that. So it sort of flips the whole process, the whole experience of looking for a job. And actually the great part about it is it's much better for disadvantaged communities who may not know what a data scientist is, may not know what a marketing representative is and so forth. So they don't even know what to look for when they look on most companies' websites. But instead, we can help them see, see themselves in jobs they never even imagined. Yeah, no, that, 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 that's great. So, so other HR leaders you know, who haven't embarked on this journey yet uh, of, of using predictive analytics, uh, what, what would be your advice to them? How would they start this journey? Well, look, for me, it was a self-funded journey. Uh, it was not like somebody handed me a bucket of money and said, go for it, you know? Um, so for me, it was figuring out where I had a business case. And, um, and for me, the business case was, first of all, in, um, in, because I'm in a skills game, in proactive retention of people with critical skills. So knowing who they were, who had a high likelihood to leave, um, you know, what the, what the um, market demand was for those skills, really, really important. Um, and, uh, and then the second thing was automation, which bought me a lot of funding um, because uh, HR is just, you know, full of opportunities <laughs> for RPA. And, um, and so those are the, I think those are the two things that if you start with that, then you'll create the great experience. My advice would not be start with the experience because it's hard to get the funding for just for an experience. Sometimes you can, and that's lovely. But um, but most of us live in a world of declining budgets, so um, so start with the business case. Yeah, and 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 you you um, you know often talked about this uh, idea of democratization of the workspace. So how do you think about uh, uh, work uh, sorry work workplace democrat uh, <clears throat> democratization? And what are the relevant factors that enable this to happen? Yeah, look, I mean, I um, I did start uh, start out as a um, with a graduate degree in labor relations, and one of the things that really struck me, I was at the Cornell School of Industrial and Labor Relations. There was this uh, this this stone that was the foundation stone, and it said, "Built on the institution of collective bargaining." And I remember looking at it one day as I was eating my donut and thinking, ah, "Is it really an institution?" And I, it was really my first realization that I disagreed, you know, that really collective bargaining is just a process, but there are other processes to get, you know, to get uh, workforce harmony or to get uh, a world where people can, can work together well. And, um, and I think what happened with social media is that it created, uh, it lessened the distance between employees and uh, their leadership teams and it gave them a voice. And so once they had a voice, you didn't need to be thinking about it as uh, uh, you know, taking orders or whatever it was, but really you got to have leaders taking advice from their own employees and giving guidance maybe, but not giving orders because it was a two-way street. 
And so, well, certainly you're finding now is, uh, you know, leaders will blog and they will get feedback and they will respond to that feedback and they will get hard questions. I mean, our, our CEO holds what we call office hours every week. And, um, he, he gets questions on, you know, when he's on video and he responds to them and they're hard questions. But if you, you know, if you don't do that in today's environment, then yes, you are shutting down um, uh, the, the um, engagement of your people. So fully engage them, they have to feel like they have a say. Even if they disagree with where you're going, they have a say. And um, you know, what we did when we thought about returning back to the workplace, you know, our first instinct was to say, let's have a jam. Let's hear from all of our employees how they would reinvent the workplace so that it's yes, safe, but also um, different, you know, better when we go back to the workplace. Um, and let's pull them all the way through. So we did a three-day jam last week, and we had 40,000 people weighing in with their views. And they were different by, uh, by country. They were different by unit. They were different by male, female. I mean, you know, we could cut it every which way, which was fantastic. But now we understand what the issues are. And, um, and yes, I think that is democratization because they've had a say to shape the future workplace. And, and, and the, you find it challenging having such a large workforce and, uh, and personalizing that experience uh, so people do have a say? Well, you know, text analytics, <laughs> you can do so much, right? And, uh, and so that's been so wonderful. Um, we've actually involved our own employees in the analytics um, so that they can help us interpret uh, what different segments of the population had to say. And um, we're in the midst of that right now. But again, involve them in analyzing and interpreting the data. Yeah. And, and, and the, you know, as, as people are working remotely, you, you see that changing as well in terms of, you know, how many people show up to work? I do. I think, you know, it's interesting. One of the questions we asked was, um, is the future of the office a place to go to work or is it a destination for team activities? And 90% of our people came back and said destination for team activities only, right? Um, so what that says is we can get our, uh, we can get our jobs done at home, but, um, but to be truly engaged, be truly plugged in, we, you know, what they, we ask them what they miss, social, uh, uh, they miss their social interaction, they miss those serendipitous running into somebody in the hallway and having that discussion that helped me be more innovative. Um, they miss the, you know, the, the chance encounters that, uh, with mentors. Um, so these are things that we still need to do. Um, people derive energy from being together. And, um, and so that's what the office will become, is a place for those kinds of activities but it won't be a place to just go and sit in your cubicle all day. Um, that, that I think is, is forever gone. Yeah. So, so I, I mean, uh, in a way COVID-19, uh, you know, uh, was a transforming event, right? For, for it was, <laughs> it was, you know, I think for some companies they weren't ready for it because they weren't operating in an agile way. And so they've tried to take kind of an industrial model of work and put it onto, you know, zoom and you can see some people, are not doing well with it. They have huge video fatigue. Because if you think of your only unit of work as a meeting, then all you're doing is being in meetings all day. But if you've moved to an agile way of working, which fortunately we had, you're actually using all kinds of different, uh, different technology to connect with people. And the video it is only for a meeting where you make decisions. And how uh, this this idea of a cognitive enterprise? Uh, can you tell us where this comes from, and uh, you know uh, what what is the relevance? Yeah, so cognitive enterprise is really um, joined up with this thought of using using digital technology to disrupt your industry, or yeah, to disrupt your industry. And so you're using AI, blockchain, five G, whatever. Um, and, um, and, and what you're doing is you're refashioning how you're going to operate with all of those technologies. And the end outcome is that you're going to compete completely differently. So that, that's what we mean by a cognitive enterprise. So uh, in, in, let's talk about skills gap. <clears throat> so yeah. you, you had a report where you know, you, uh, IBM uh, did, did some research and how, 
according to the report, 120 million workers will need retraining uh, as AI continues yeah. to take jobs. And uh, so how do you approach this idea of uh, reskilling, upskilling uh, in this context of this report? Well, for us, um, reskilling and upskilling is the most important thing we can do with talent. As I said earlier, you know, the, um, the shelf life of skills is really short. So even if you hire the very best, you know, person in Kubernetes, you know, that's only going to last so long. They have to keep learning. And um, so having, uh, first of all, people who are curious, you know, hiring for people who are curious um, and have a thirst to continue to learn is really important. But then you need to have a culture of learning and a culture that says, I won't be successful unless I continue to learn. So, you know, seven years ago, our CEO said 40 hours of learning. Uh, I expect everyone to do 40 hours of learning. And um, at the time, that was like massive. Well, last year, the average IBMer, average, spent 89 hours learning. But what was even more exciting was the average executive spent 96 hours. So what that was saying is, we don't know everything. You know, we're, we got to be humble about what we don't know, too, as executives. And um, so we got to keep learning. But most importantly, you need an irresistible learning platform that people want to use. So in our company, 25,000 people a day are on the platform. It's, it's, uh, it's sticky. People are on it all the time because it's fun. It's personalized. Um, knows who you are, knows what you want to queue up, knows what your goals are, knows what other people like you have been learning. Um, so all of those things are really important. It has to be easy to use on your phone. Um, those, those are really, really critical to, to upskill and reskill. Reskilling is a whole lot harder. Reskilling is moving into a kind of a new job family is the way we think about it. Um, it is so much harder and apprenticing and shadowing are really important elements of it. The great news about being remote now is um, you can do that more easily because you used to be confined to only so many people in a meeting, right? Now you can have somebody just watching the meeting, seeing what's happening. Um, you can have people join conversations that before they perhaps you know weren't in the same location. Um, but because everybody's on video, it's so much easier. So you know there are some real silver linings to to being in COVID. Yes, absolutely. So in, in terms of uh, the, uh, measuring the skills gap, right? So if, if I'm an employee, would I uh, take an assessment or how, how would I come up with the notion of, you know, what skills I need to learn? Yeah. So let me give you an example of a seller. So if you're a seller and you are, uh, your industry is financial services and you're in what we'll say band seven, you will know exactly what the technical skills are that you need to have, the industry skills and the selling skills. That's already known. It's, if, you, if you fired up your machine and looked at your profile on um, your learning, it would tell you what you're inferred in those areas, your inferred skills, and what you still need to have and what's the gap. All right. And then it'll, it'll, it'll serve up to you. How are you going to close that gap? You could take this course, you know, this Stanford course, you could watch this YouTube. There are all kinds of obviously different ways of getting it. But the key is in the end, you got to certify that you've got these skills that you have a gap in because you can't advance without closing that gap. And, uh, and then you'll get digital badges in certain areas, which you can display on LinkedIn or, or on your personal profile. It'll be important to you as well. But most, but most importantly, we have a very clear pathway for you. Um, and you'll understand where you are relative to where you need to be and how you can close the gap. So the, the system uh, knows you have a gap in a certain selling skill because uh, of, of an assessment or a manager feedback? How does that happen? So it's skills inference, as I said before, um, but you know what you've been assessed at. Um, you can go in and query it. You can you know, say, hey, I don't agree with it. Your manager will take a look at it and together you can decide to move it up if, uh, if, it's, under, if, if it's underestimated where your skill is. Um, but skills inference is where we start. Great. So staying on this topic uh, a bit more, so IBM has these uh, programs uh, that are skill-based programs, IBM New Collar Jobs, Pre-Tech, from, uh, yep. Tech Reentry, and they're focused on high school students uh, and, uh, and professionals who want to restart their uh, careers. Yep. 
<clears throat> so uh, can, can you talk a bit more about those? Yeah, so PTAC is uh, really um, for um, kids who are in a high school that has a very high dropout rate is, is where we started. We actually started in Brooklyn. It's now all over the world. Um, but these are kids who um, really haven't been part of the new economy. And we saw a real problem. Well, first of all, there's this skill gap in the United States, so start there. But secondly, a real problem in that huge swaths of people were being left out of, of the economy that was booming, the high-tech economy. And so, um, so we decided to invest in these schools, bring them a curriculum, bring them teachers and mentors, and intern them and then hire them. Um, so that's what we've been doing. Of course, we don't hire all of them because so many other companies want to hire them. Um, and uh, it's a six-year high school instead of uh, four years, but you come out with an associate's degree. Um, and, uh, and so they're qualified to enter the job market into those high paid jobs. So that's, that was, that's one thing that we've done. Another is apprenticeships, which is a little different. It's bringing in people who, um, chose not to go to college, who may have, um, a nursing degree or maybe a farmer. We have, you know, one that is a Starbucks barista, but they're from all walks of life, but they're people who want to reinvent their careers. Um, and, uh, and they come in as apprentices, um, and we have them for d data science, we have them for um, program managers, we even have them for recruiting, uh, for tech recruiting. But these are all jobs that um, are, you know, very, very much in demand in the marketplace. And it's a, it's a two-year uh, apprenticeship. And um, we went and got Department of Labor certification and so forth, so they really do have, you know, something they can take with them. Um, then, you know, you also mentioned um, the return to work of, of people who've been out of the tech reentry is what we call it. People who might have, you know, had a technical degree, had a lovely career, but for whatever reason had to step off the career track. Maybe they decided to have children, maybe they looked after, you know, an ill relative. But then technology took off and they got left behind. And how do they get back into the workplace? And so we have a program where we retrain them uh, in technology and, um, and they can restart their careers. So, so the, the philosophy behind these programs is that then IBM can potentially find uh, folks or is it a different goal? This philosophy, all this philosophy is that a more inclusive tech industry is a better tech industry. No, that's great. That's wonderful. So, so the we were talking about pandemic, uh, the, the, this pandemic. Uh, you know, so how has it changed the role of HR? You think? Well, it's actually, I think, put us in the forefront. Um, it's interesting. The Economist interviewed me a couple of months ago and talked about how um, you know the the accounting or the finance function CFO was like the the top dog after the two thousand and nine uh, problem, but now it's the CHRO. So I'm not sure we, we're, you know, quite deserving of that. But the point being that, you know, we are the ones who are responsible for the health and safety of our workforce. And, uh, and so it's been really important for us to pull all the right people together to solve for these really, really big problems that we're all facing. Well, very true. And have you been uh, benefiting from the fact that you have a global footprint so you can see how the the COVID-19 turned up in China versus you know, Absolutely. the US. Yeah, I bring on my teams from uh, all around the world every week. And, um, you know, China, of course, were the first to experience it. And uh, it made it real for us because we would be on um, video with them and they would all be wearing their masks. Well, you know, you can't tell who's speaking when you're on video and everyone's wearing a mask. And it made us realize this is this is ridiculous, you know, that we all need to be home or we all need to be at the office, but this combination thing doesn't work on video. Um, so that was helpful. And um, Korea went back, you know, um, two weeks ago, but they've had another outbreak, right? And um, they have a phenomenal tracing program, government tracing program, which, you know, helps them find, you know, you all know the story about the, the guy that went to the nightclubs and 266 people were found, but they, you know, but they must have tested 8,000 people to find those 266 people. So it, it does help you understand how it might work in, in the future for us to see how it's operating in, in countries with different kinds of, um, different kinds of democracies. Yeah, that's fascinating. So, um, and any farting words for our audience has been a very engaging conversation. 
It's been fun. Thank you for having me. Um, look, you know, my, my parting words would be um, the experience with the employee is just really important and it couldn't be more important than right now. Um, they want to believe in the companies that they work for and they, um, the trust and confidence that they can feel about their workplace is probably the most important thing we can do is, is to instill that and to, to keep their trust and confidence. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you, Diane. It's uh, been a wonderful conversation and, uh, you know, wishing you much success in your role. Thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed this conversation. All the best. <laughs>